All right, uh, welcome. So I'm using the microphone because we are uh, recording this, so would like to be heard. So welcome to uh, a distinguished seminar. Uh, this is the Hariri Institute Distinguished Seminar. So we call, we have, as you know, a variety of seminars that we are organizing. We call them distinguished when the, the guest and the speaker is distinguished, and that is the case today. So before I introduce the speaker for today's seminar, uh, just a few things, uh, a few of the events that are coming up on uh, November 30th, we are organizing an AI and education symposium that I would sort of be interesting to look at uh, the impact of AI and generative AI in education. And uh, on December 15, we have Sharon Huang, who is the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Studies at Penn State, uh, that she will talk in the Artificial Intelligence Research uh, Group, uh, distinguished speaker. So in terms of logistics today, so Milind will give his presentation. I will ask that you, know, you can ask questions during the presentation, but keep them only for clarifications and leave the broader, more open-ended questions for the end of the talk. And with that, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce today Milin Tampe, who is the Gordon McKay Professor of Computer Science and Director of the Center for Research in Computation and Society at uh, Harvard. He is also the Principal Scientist and Director for AI for social good at uh, Google Research. He has been a recipient of many awards. I'm not going to list them all because it will take the whole seminar. Uh, so just uh, some of them, the IJ uh, Kai John McCarthy Award, so that's the international uh, joint conferences on AI, AAAI, uh, Robert Engelmore Memorial Lecture Award, International Conference on Autonomous Agents and Multi-Agent Systems, ACM Autonomous Agents Research Award, the Informs Wagner Prize, and uh, the list goes on. He's a fellow of uh, AAAI and ACM, and he works on AI and public safety. He has received the Columbus Fellowship Foundation Homeland Security Award and uh, commendations from the U.S. Coast Guard and the Federal Air Marshal Service and airport police at the city of Los Angeles for work that uh, he has done with them. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, and uh, you. the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you for inviting me, and I'm really glad to be here. Um, so my team and I have been focused on working on AI for social impact for the past uh, 15 years or more focusing on topics of public health, conservation, and uh, public safety and security. The key challenge we focus on is how to optimize our limited intervention resources. So just to jump right into the lessons that we have learned, and also as a way of uh, highlighting some of our previous work, let me start by pointing out the first lesson that uh, achieving social impact and AI innovation go hand in hand. So with respect to public health, we have large populations to serve, but limited number of public health resources. Concrete example is work we've done with youth experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. Harnessing the social networks of these youth, we're able to show that our influence maximization algorithms are far more effective in spreading HIV risk information and reducing HIV risk behaviors compared to traditional approaches. But this work required innovation in the area of social networks because the networks themselves are not given to us ahead of time and have to be sampled. With respect to conservation, we have large conservation areas to protect but limited number of ranger resources. Concrete example is work we've done in Uganda and Cambodia. We're harnessing past poaching data. We are able to predict where poachers set traps or snares. And for the past several years, have been able to remove thousands, if not tens of thousands of these snares. This work required innovation in the area of what we call green security games, which combines machine learning and game theory. With respect to public safety, we've contributed a new model called Stackelberg Security Games and contributed new algorithms that have been in use by security agencies in the United States, such as the Federal Air Marshal Service. So if you've been on an international flight, United, Delta, American, et cetera, whether there was an air marshal or not on your flight, may have been determined by our software. 
or generating patrols in ports of Boston, New York, Los Angeles. Uh, so for the US Coast Guard, those are also things that we've done. All of these have been long-term commitments from my research group, uh, 10 years or more. And they may seem like very diverse application areas, but they're tied together by the fact that they're all instances of multi-agent systems models that you'll see cutting across these domains. A second lesson is that in AI for social impact, the entire data to deployment pipeline is important. Uh, we start our work by immersing ourselves in the domain, trying to understand the problem our partner may face, the kind of data they have available. Following that, a predictive model, a machine learning model, may make predictions about which of the cases faced by this nonprofit are high risk or low risk, or government agency or whoever is our partner. Following that, a prescription algorithm, because we don't have limited resources and we can't intervene on all of the cases we want to intervene on, the prescriptive optimization algorithm tells us which of these cases we should actually intervene on. And then finally, evaluation, deployment, all of this is important because we are working in AI for social impact. If there is no social impact, then it is not AI for social impact. So with that, I'm uh, delighted to now introduce the work I'm gonna discuss with you today. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you about our most recent work on AI for maternal and child care. This is work with the world's two largest mobile health programs for maternal and child care. The first one is called Amitra, uh, which is based in Mumbai, which has about 200,000 mothers enrolled at a time. The second is Kilkari, which is a pan-India program, which has about 3 million mothers enrolled at a time. The key result is we've improved access to health information for these mothers. I'll also talk about work we have done in AI for HIV prevention in Los Angeles, and then finally close with the work on AI for wildlife conservation. During this, um, I'll highlight papers, recent papers from AI conferences, uh, mostly focusing on real world results, but there are lots of simulation results and so on if you wanted to look into our papers. And I'll highlight the role of the lead PhD student or postdoc by putting up their picture in the top right hand corner of the slide on which their work is shown. And I also wanted to highlight a key collaborator, uh, Aparna Taneja from Google Research India, who is a co-author on several papers in the AI for maternal and child care area. So let's begin by talking about uh, Emitra. This is the mobile health program. So the start here is that uh, you know, we are facing a maternal mortality crisis. Mothers dying during childbirth or soon after. The UN sustainable development target for 2030 is that the maternal mortality ratio should be below 70 per 100,000 live births. That's mothers dying sh during childbirth or soon after. Um, where we are today, the dashed line is the UN target. If you look at Western Europe, that's much lower. United States, the numbers are rising, but still lower. If you look at the rest of the world, though, together, we see that the numbers are much higher. I pointed to Mississippi here. I'll come to that in a minute. It may seem like this is a problem of out there, but it's also a problem of right here. As uh, Michelle Williams, a former dean of uh, School of Public Health points out, that um, for black women in Mississippi, the mortality rate, rate is 65.1 deaths per 100,000 live births, 20 times worse than women in Greece, Poland, or Slovenia. And you can see that's, uh, uh, that's what was plotted there. Uh, today, though, we are going to focus on uh, India where uh, that's where our work has been. And the numbers there are higher than the UN target, decreasing, but still higher. We are very fortunate to be working with a nonprofit called Arman, which is active in 20 states in India. It works with 41 million mothers. It's a massive nonprofit. And we are very inspired by the founder of Arman, Dr. Aparna Hegde, who points out that uh, pregnancy is not a disease, childhood is not an ailment, and dying due to a natural life event is not acceptable. I met with Dr. Hegde in Mumbai in a Starbucks in 2019 in the summer, and after, being, uh, after talking to her and just being impacted and being inspired by her work, I decided that our research group should work towards assisting their very important cause. So, the first problem we decided to focus on is their M-Mitra program, this mobile health program. Basically, it's a program for new and expecting mothers, where mothers enroll. And from the time they enroll to the baby being one year old, they get 
two, a two-minute automated voice message every week in their local language. And so it's a fancy message with some music and this and that, but the content delivered, uh, this is a small snippet of one of those messages, is about, for example, for you and your baby to be strong, you need lots of iron, eat you know, leafy green vegetables, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the only kind of information that these families are receiving, these mothers are receiving. And so far, two million women have enrolled in this program and benefited from it. In randomized control trials, Arman has shown that in these 141 messages that these mothers receive from the time they enroll to the baby being one year old, if you imagine a group of mothers who got these messages and a group of mothers who didn't get these messages, you compare the outcomes. There's a 30% increase in infants with triple birth weight at the end of the year due to these messages. A significant increase in women visiting the doctor's office. So this is a program that really seems to benefit the mother and the health of the baby. So where do we come in? Unfortunately, 30 to 40% of the mothers who enroll drop out of the program, become low listeners. To understand why, we went around to different sites that Arman enrolls women and the homes of the beneficiaries. I have grown up in Mumbai. I know uh, some of these neighborhoods, but I've never gone inside the home of some of these beneficiaries. So these are families that are, uh, put, to put it academically, their family income is 95% of these families are where, where their family income is significantly below the international poverty line. And so these are people who have significant disadvantages, and no wonder that there are pressures as a result of which they drop out of the program. So what can we do? Arman has this call center from where they can issue service calls. So these are humans who can give calls to these mothers to persuade them to stay in the program and not drop out. But this is a small call center, and there's a large number of mothers. So imagine now that we have, uh, you know, and the total number of beneficiaries here, 100,000 mothers are enrolled in the program. Each mother every week will get a message about their, you know, like the message I showed. This is an automated voice message going out to this mother. But some mothers start to drop out. Now from the call center, we can give 1,000 calls per week to try to get these mothers to not drop out. So this is a human calling these mothers. So we have to choose 1,000 out of this 100,000 such that the total number of health messages that the mothers listen to are, are high. So consider, uh, just uh, for illustration, this a further simplified example where we have one health worker and five mothers under our care. Four of them shown in red have not heard this automated voice message sent to them. The last one, shown in green, has heard this message. And now the health worker has to decide, who do I call to persuade them to continue to listen? Supposing she says the first two, shown in red, this turns out to be a good choice. These two who are in red turn to green, so they start listening. But, uh, and there's one more who was in red also turns to green. And now there's two left in red, and the health worker again has to decide, who do I call next week? And she can only call two people. In this case, if she decides that the two who are in red are the good people to call here, this turns out to be a bad choice because in this case, the two who are in red don't turn to green, and the ones who are in green also turn to red. So the point is that when we have, a chal when we have this decision of who to call, there are challenges. A call may not change a beneficiary state. On the other hand, some beneficiaries may start changing state on their own. So how do you select a thousand out of these 100,000 beneficiaries? So we turn to what are called restless bandits to try to select K out of N beneficiaries. For those who may not be familiar with this restless bandit model, each mother is modeled as a Markov decision problem. So the mother might be in a bad state where she has not listened to a voice call or a good state. She has listened to this automated voice call. We can intervene on the mother by giving her a service call or not. If we Based on our intervention or not, we can model the behavior of the mother. If we don't intervene, the probability of going from a bad state to good state is only 0.2. But if we intervene, the probability of going from a bad state to good state increases to 0.8. So this is how we model the behavior of one mother. In reality, of course, there's 100,000 of these mothers. 
and we have to choose a thousand of these mothers to call. This problem is known to be P-space hard. It's, it's difficult to solve. So in reality, these problems get solved by what is called a Wittle index. This is a way of ranking these mothers. The Wittle index is a way of computing the benefit of our intervention. And so higher the benefit, higher the Wittle index. And so we can rank all of the 100,000 beneficiaries and pick the top 1,000. More formally, the Wittle index is defined as the infimum subsidy we offer a passive action, a non-intervention action, such that its Q value becomes equal to the Q value of the intervention action. But for the purposes of this talk, Wittle index will be used to rank these beneficiaries. There is not a general purpose algorithm out of the box to compute the Wittle index. Fortunately, we had worked on an algorithm in 2016, which we could use for this purpose. There's, however, one uh, other problem. The transition probabilities, the behaviors of these mothers, are not known to us in advance. What we do have, though, is previous beneficiary data from previous mothers, uh, given their features, such as age, income, education, et cetera. We also have, for each mother, their behaviors. The mother was in a bad state. She got a service call, an intervention, remained in a bad state. Bad state, intervention, good state, et cetera. So from all this past data, given um, we can learn a model that maps the features of the mother, age, income, education, to the transition probability, the behaviors of the mothers. So when a new mother walks in, we can model her behavior. So this I will call, and then following that, we will choose the top K beneficiaries using our Wittle index. So I'll call this a two-stage approach. So first, we try to learn as accurate a model as possible of the mother's behavior. Then we optimize to choose the top K mothers. So these two steps are done separately from each other. And of course, now it's time to evaluate this application in the field to deploy. To that end, we did a field study with 23,000 mothers. These were, as far as we know, first large-scale application of these restless bandits in the field. And so for public health, and these uh, 23,000 mothers were divided into three groups. The restless bandit group, uh, round robin group, and current standard of care. Each mother in each group received the automated health message every week. So there's no change in that. What changes is who gets the service call to persuade them to stay in the program. And so in the restless bandit group, the 225 arms get pulled, meaning 225 mothers get called every week. But who gets called gets determined by highest Wittle index. So in the round robin group, on the other hand, again, we call 225 mothers each week, what we call the first 225, then the next 225, et cetera. And in the current standard of care, no calls are going out. And now we want to know how many more health messages, the automated health messages, are listened to in each of the groups compared to the current standard of care. And what we find here, is on the x-axis are the weeks. On the y-axis is cumulatively how many more health messages are listened to in each of these groups compared to the current standard of care. The blue is the restless bandit group. The orange is the round robin group. What we can see is that round robin calling makes hardly any improvement over current standard of care. But with this restless bandit approach, we have 600 more messages listened to by these mothers at the end of seven weeks. What's the point here is that it's important to optimize these service calls. If we just call people in a round robin fashion or random fashion, as we've shown, then there's no improvement that is gained in the engagement of these mothers. Secondly, the restless bandit group cuts by 32% the drop off rate over the current standard of care. We have statistical significance results in a AAAI paper. So this was our first attempt to improve engagement, and it seemed to have worked, and we started deploying the system, and then we realized that there's actually even a, be a better way to improve engagement even further. So let's go back to this data to deployment pipeline I had shown, and the fact that there was this two-stage model. First, we maximized learning accuracy, and then separately, we optimized who to call using a Wittle index. But maximizing learning accuracy doesn't lead to maximizing decision quality. And I can show this to you using actual real-world data. So there are two data sets here. 
The first one, in, uh, this is all from the Emitra program. Real data sets, orange, is a data set where we have high learning accuracy, high predictive accuracy. We can predict the mother's behaviors more accurately. Blue is where we are not as accurate in terms of predicting these mother's behaviors. So now we would imagine that if we computed who to call using Whittle index from the orange data set, we should get higher engagement from these mothers. And with blue, we should get lower engagement. But the result is exactly the opposite. With orange, we get worse performance, less engagement from these mothers. And this is real world results from real world calls. With blue, we get higher engagement. So why might this happen? So here's an illustrative example. On the x-axis here is some feature, it may be age. And on the y-axis is mother's behaviors being modeled. The blue dots are all the low-risk mothers. There's lots of them. The red dots are high-risk mothers. Now, if you say we want to learn an ac as accurate a model as possible using this two-stage approach, we may get this green regressor line, which is high learning accuracy, but it's bad for our decision quality because it doesn't catch the high-risk mothers who we want. Decision-focused learning modifies the loss function so that it directly tries to maximize the decision quality, what we are really interested in. We are not as interested in maximizing learning accuracy. We are really interested in maximizing decision quality. And what this leads to is this green regression line, which is bad in terms of learning accuracy, but leads to higher decision quality because it gets us the high-risk mothers. In terms of uh, what's happening here underneath, with the two-stage model, when we take gradients to up, uh, update, we take gradients to update our transition probabilities. So it's trying to learn the behaviors as accurately as possible. In the case of decision-focused learning, we take gradients directly from the decision quality so that we get higher decision quality. This requires some work in trying to show that the Whittle index itself is differentiable, which Kai Wang, who, who did this work, was able to show. So having done this decision-focused learning as a way uh, to move forward, we then ran another field experiment with 9,000 beneficiaries. 3,000 were in the decision-focused learning arm, 3,000 in the two-stage arm, and 3,000 current standard of care. And again, it's the same procedure of calling the same number of mothers in each group, except for the current standard of care where no calls are going out. If we look at the predictive accuracy, where were we able to predict the mother's behaviors more accurately with the two-stage model? to show we are able to predict the mother's behaviors more accurately. But if you look at actually after giving service calls, who listened more to the messages, we see that decision-focused learning on the x-axis are weeks, on the y-axis how many more health messages are listened to. We see that decision-focused learning leads to higher messages being listened to. And so decision-focused learning is the approach that we've used in the deployment now. And this is a deployment. Uh, it's called Saheli. Saheli is a, an acronym, but it also translate as, uh, translates as friend in Hindi. This is to tell you we worked very hard to come up with a good acronym. The number of beneficiaries served so far have been more than 300,000. It's been in use since April of 2022. It's, we estimate the drop-offs prevented to be 30% from our sampling. And for the bottom 25% listeners, exposure to content has increased 130%. So this has uh, been appreciated by our collaborator, uh, Dr. Aparna Hegde. There's a YouTube video, AI for Social Good in partnership with Arman, if you wanted to take a look, where she points out that we are able to reach out to more and more women each week and get them back into the fold and save lives because of AI. There's also an interview with a beneficiary, and I'm going to play that. Um, so let's see. So this mother is uh, speaking in Marathi, having, uh, having a mother in the place I grew up in Mumbai, a Marathi speaker benefiting from my research, that's uh, deeply satisfying. 
So where are we going from here? There's at least three areas of work. One uh, is this making this Whittle index more robust. So previously, I had talked about estimating exact behaviors by these exact transition probabilities. But our data is sparse. So instead of exact transition probabilities, if we give intervals like the probability of transitioning is not 0.55, but it's between 0.4 to 0.7 intervals of this type, then that may lead us to come up with better, more robust policies. And so that's one of the approaches we've been following. The goal here, the approach to use here is what we call minimizing maximum regret, where our planner is trying to come up with Whittle index policies that are as good as possible, that improve performance as much as possible. But nature is trying to choose these parameter settings, these transition probabilities to get our algorithm to perform as worse as possible. So in this way, by competing against nature, we are trying to make our algorithm robust to uncertainties. This, is get, this gets solved as a game. Um, this is a very large game. Solving these games required what's called double oracle approach. Not going to have time to go into it. But in simulation with Armand's real data, we can show that this robust policies would lead to lower regret, lower is better compared to the state of the art, which doesn't take into account this uncertainty. Another idea is to personalize the service calls towards particular mothers. So instead of just learning from past data, if we can learn from whatever interactions we get from the mother online, then that would allow us to better service these mothers. And to that end, there is this uh, UC Vittle approach. Some of you may be familiar with bandit algorithms, stochastic bandit algorithms which are optimism in the face of uncertainty type of algorithms. So here, we use a similar idea. We select the top K arms to pull the top K Whittle indices to call mothers. And now, uh, when we get their inputs, when we understand what's happening, we maintain a confidence bound on the transition probabilities. But higher transition probability doesn't mean a higher Whittle index. So now we have to figure out which wit how to update these Whittle index and then call the and then use that to choose the top K mothers to call. So again, on the x-axis here is time. On the y-axis is regret. Lower regret is better. And what we are showing here is that if we could do this online learning, this is all in simulation. If we could update our transition probabilities online rather than relying purely on past data, that we would do better. So this is one area. A second area is could this Whittle indices, uh, this restless bandit approach, be used for other public health challenges? So to that end, the uh, uh, challenge that we focused on also is tuberculosis, which kills 1.6 million people worldwide, half a million people in India alone. So treatment for TB is to take, a, take this medicine every day for six months. I get tired if I'm asked to take something for seven days. Uh, six months is a long time, and patients drop off. So now, how do you track these patients and get them to keep taking these medicines. Again, there's a call center from where health workers call these patients to remind them to take their medicine. A lot of patients under one health worker's care. And it's important because the, if the patients don't take their medicine, they don't get well. And it also leads to drug-resistant bacteria. So it is important for them to finish their course. So the challenge, of course, is that the health worker doesn't know who has taken their medicine, who has not can't track this. So now she has to decide from states that are unknown who to call. So she calls the first three people. Two of them say, I took my medicine last night. One says, I didn't. And she has to decide tomorrow, who do I call to remind people? And so you can see that this problem is quite similar to the problem I mentioned earlier, except that the state of the patient is not known ahead of time. So this is a restless bandit, except we have partially observable Markov decision problems. The key, though, is that when we call the patient, our uncertainty about the state of the patient collapses. We know the patient took the medicine or not last night. So this idea can be used in what we have called collapsing restless bandits. The uncertainty collapses. And this can be used to develop fast algorithms. A second approach is this uh, uh, somehow dealing with diabetes, which, of course, is a disease with you know, hundreds of million people suffer from it. And so now there are these digital apps to maintain, uh, to mark adherence of patients. So for example, trying to determine if they've taken their medication, if, uh, if they've taken their measurement of blood sugar, and so forth. 
Um, and so people who fall behind on this, there are coaches who can be allocated health coaches to try to get them to adhere to these good health practices. Again, it's the same challenge, limited number of health coaches, lots of patients. And so this again can be done with uh, restless bandits. Again, these are results from simulation showing that the restless bandits can do better. A third area of future work, um, we are, which we are very excited by, is this idea of building a large pre-trained restless bandit model so that for newer health challenges, this model can be used out of the box. So we are focused here on multi-action streaming restless bandit. So, so far I've talked about restless bandit where on each patient, on each beneficiary, either you give a service call or not, there's only one intervention. But imagine there are multiple interventions, you can call them, you can text them, you can send a health worker to their home. So now there are multi-action, multiple actions available for each beneficiary. And furthermore, we may have beneficiaries opting in or out of the program. And so this is a streaming situation. These problems cannot be solved by this Whittle Index policy. So the state of the art is this approach called DDLPO, which uses reinforcement learning. But this DDLPO cannot be used out of the box, zero shot. That means any new situation, new set of patients, new set of mothers, we would need to train this model from scratch, which we want to avoid. And so the question is, can we come up with a pre-trained model that will allow zero shot generalization? So that's our most recent uh, work, uh, paper under submission, and it's using this model-free reinforcement learning trend uh, rather than this decision-focused approach. So the key idea there is to exploit the fact that each mother here, each beneficiary comes with features, age, income, et cetera, and there's lots of these people, lots of these mothers enrolled, which means that you can exploit generalization across these different arms of the R map and also use this to generalize to new set of mothers. Very concretely, uh, uh, this is a little bit a new notation here, but generally in DDLPO, when we try to compute the value function, we have this equation where we are trying to sum up the Q values of different arms. But these Q values don't take into account the features of these mothers, the age, income, et cetera, et cetera. In our newer approach, this is what we call prefer map, pre-trained flexible R map, we take into account the, the Z variables, the features of these mothers. And so because of that uh, use, we can generalize, converge faster. And also, uh, we have this variable to allow mothers to opt in and opt out, or beneficiaries to opt in and opt out. So with this pre-trained model in simulation here, we are showing with three synthetic data sets. Orange is the prefer map result. The gray is this DDLPO, but it requires training. So we train this model beforehand, we bring it to a new situation, and now we say, give us the result of who to call or who to intervene on. And we are able to show here that this prefer map out of the box is able to achieve similar performance to what DDLPO could do, but it required more training on the spot. And if some people drop out of the program, say 20% of the people drop out, DDLPO cannot function but this prefer map still continues to function without any additional training. So this is all synthetic data sets. We have to try this out in the actual Armand domain. So now let me switch to the second project I wanted to discuss, which is uh, Kilkari. This is the world's largest maternal health mobile program. Mobile health program. And this is a program from India's Ministry of health and welfare. Uh, 30 million mothers in total have benefited so far from this program. At the time, 3 million mothers are enrolled in this program. This is an advertisement. This uh, 5.28 crore is 52 million messages, audio messages going out. And Arman has been tasked to generalize to expand this program even more across India. To understand uh, this program, I've been visiting various sites uh, of this program, trying to understand the challenges that are faced and so on. From our perspective, from an AI perspective, there are several challenges. One, we do not get any features, any demographic features from the government, age, income, et cetera. All we have is the listening uh, time for the mother from previous weeks. So mother listened to, 10 seconds in the first week of the message, 30 seconds in the second week, et cetera. It's the same, pro it's a similar program to what we saw in Amitra, but basically 
we have no, no access to features. So to deal with this, I'm going to talk to you about time series restless bandage. Second, there are multiple interventions that are possible instead of a single intervention. Can send a health worker to this mother's home, can give an automated call, et cetera. And so I'm going to not uh, have time to talk about this third uh, challenge. So here's the first question. We want to predict the behaviors of these mothers in the future, but we don't have demographic data. Can we just use the time, for, you know, the amount of listening time from last week to predict what's going to happen next week? And we realize that the more, date, more previous week's data we give, the better we are in predicting future listening. So this graph is showing Markov model order. How many previous weeks of listening time do you feed the model? before it's able, uh, uh, when it's making predictions. And the more previous weeks of data you give, the higher the predictive accuracy. So using this idea then, we are able to use a time series model to predict the mother's behavior. So for example, for mother number one, she listened to maybe 30 seconds in the first week, 60 seconds in the third, second week, then didn't listen at all in the last week, and now we're trying to say, okay, What's going to happen in the following week? That's the prediction we are trying to do. And we do this using training data from the state of Odisha in India and use that to predict beneficiaries' future time, listening time. So having, having these predictions in hand, we can now rank uh, the beneficiaries to call or to intervene on in, by using a new index, which we call time series arm ranking index. And the index works as follows. You say, OK, what if we intervene on this beneficiary using a one particular intervention idea, one particular intervention approach, how much time would it take for this beneficiary to drop below the listening threshold? And V and I is, uh, if we don't intervene on this beneficiary, how long would it take for this beneficiary N with the, to drop below the intervention threshold? And we take this ratio of, uh, and the higher the value, that means the higher the benefit of this intervention on this beneficiary and then use that to rank all of the beneficiaries and choose to intervene on them. So right now, we are in simulation mode. We have data from 4,000 mothers in the state of Odisha. We simulated a situation where 1% of these beneficiaries got actual health worker intervention, 1% got automated phone call. And so we can optimize who gets called using two different methods of this PARI, this uh, time series uh, arm ranking index and compare that to random, which is give, given the same budget, but now these uh, people are called at random or intervened on at random. Again, similarly, on the x-axis are weeks, on the y-axis how many more health messages are listened to, and we can see that with this newer index approach, we would do better than random. But this is all in simulation. We are very excited by a field study that may get started in December 1, maybe December 15th in the state of Odisha. And so this is something that we, uh, that we are moving forward with. These same ideas can be used by NGOs in other parts of the world. We have worked with Help Mom uh, NGO in Nigeria. Uh, we have written this paper with them for AI-driven vaccine intervention using similar ideas. Uh, this is just theoretical paper. There's no, I mean, model, simulation, et cetera. We are very glad that they've taken these ideas and actually deployed it in practice in Nigeria and uh, shown the benefits of this approach. Let me now switch to a completely different approach, a completely different problem. And this is work that we've done with youth experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. So this was done when I was uh, in Los Angeles. Um, and so this is um, AI for HIV prevention. So this is work. You know, the problem here is that there's 6,000 youth who sleep on the streets of Los Angeles every night. The rates of HIV in this population are 10 times the rates of the normal house population. We want to prevent HIV in this population, but we can't go. Health, homeless shelters who want to do this cannot go and talk to individual health workers. So the question is, how do you, do, how do you spread this information? So these homeless shelters will call key peer leaders, influencers, educate them about HIV prevention, expect them to talk to their friends, their friends to talk to their friends, and in this way, information to spread in the social network. So concretely, it works something like this. Each number here is a youth. Each edge is a friendship between two youth. 
And now we want to select key influencers within this network so as to maximize expected number of influenced youth who know about HIV prevention. This is a photograph from our actual intervention in progress with our social work colleague educating these youth. Information is supposed to spread in this independent cascade model. If youth C is educated about HIV prevention, their friend D will be educated with a probability of 0.4. If D is educated, their friend E will be educated with a probability of 0.4 and so on. So before we started this work, there was at least a decade, if not more, than a decade of work in computer science talking about influence maximization algorithms. When you take these algorithms to the field, though, several problems are apparent. First, I talked about these transition probabilities, these propagation probabilities being available, but in reality, they're not. Second, these are youth in difficult circumstances. We may say we want these influencers to come to our session, but one of the youth coming in may get arrested, another one may choose to run away and send their friend. So the people we get as influencers were not the people we called. So we have to have a multi-step dynamic policy to keep compensating for people who didn't show up or new people who showed up. And thirdly, the social network itself is not known to us in advance. And so we have to sample it. We have a small sampling budget. We can, call, we can sample, say, 10% of the youth to get their social network. I noticed that uh, we, are after, we are about uh, 10.45 or so, so maybe I have 10 more minutes. Is that fair? Um, so I'm going to skip over some details. We can come to this sampling algorithm later if we have time. But I'm just going to run to the actual system we built. It's called Change. It's got the network sampling. It's got this robust multi-step policy, and then says, who are the key influencers to select? We ran this experiment with 750 youth in, this, uh, in Los Angeles. This is work with Professor Eric Rice in the School of Social Work at USC. Three arms, 250 in change, 250 in degree centrality. Bring in the most popular youth as influencers. This is the traditional approach. And 250 in control group, no intervention at the no influencers, et cetera. And now we want to see at the end of one month and at the end of three months, how many, what was the change in the HIV risk behaviors? And so this work was done with three homeless shelters in Los Angeles, my friend's place, Los Angeles LGBT Center, and Safe Place for Youth. Again, first large-scale application of this influence maximization in terms of public health. And here are the results. For at the end of one month, in terms of reduction in condomless anal sex, one of the HIV risk behaviors, we can see with change, there's more than 30% reduction. But with degree centrality and control, there's hardly any difference caused at the end of one month. At the end of three months, we can see that degree centrality begins to catch up, but change is still superior. The fact that this reduction happened faster, though, is important because this is a risk behavior, and also youth come and go. This is a dynamic population. So having this reduction happen faster is important. We also looked at other behavior changes, for example, reduction in condomless vaginal sex, and we can again see that change is superior. There's statistical significance results in our paper in the Journal of AIDS and AAAI and so forth. And here's our collaborator saying good things about our work. Um, in terms of future work, one is ensuring fairness of who gets influenced across different racial groups, et cetera, and also using reinforcement learning to speed up our algorithms. So I'm now going to come to uh, the final project I wanted to cover for wildlife conservation. I'll spend about five minutes on this, and then after that, I'll be very happy to take your questions. So this is work inspired by my visit to Uganda. Um, we, you know, national parks there, there's wonderful wildlife, but there's also threats to this wildlife. Snares or traps that get placed by the thousands to maim and kill wildlife. This is from The Guardian, uh, an image just in 20, from last year. You can see a mountain, two tons of these snares put in the park to kill animals. You can see the rangers there. And so we have to assist these rangers trying to catch these snares and remove them. But there's tall grass, there's 100 rangers, thousands of square kilometers of the park, how can we help them? And you can see it's a, very, it's a very difficult job. So we can divide this park into one kilometer by one kilometer grid square. And now, going back to our machine learning and optimization, 
We can use past data to make predictions on where poachers may strike. And then we can use game theory to assist rangers in determining where to patrol. So let's focus first on just the prediction, trying to predict where the poachers may set traps. So we had 14 years of data from Uganda, range of patrol frequency in each grid square, animal density, distance to rivers, roads, and villages. We we'll skip over the model. We built the model. We tested it in our lab. It looks, uh, you know, the standard uh, results look good. But this was not convincing to our friends, Uganda Wildlife Authority and Wildlife Conservation Society. They wanted a test in the field to find places where they haven't patrolled and show them that we can predict snares where they haven't patrolled. And to that end, we chose these two nine square kilometer areas in Queen Elizabeth National Park, shown in green. The red dots are where they had found snares before. We aren't asking them, go back to places where you found snares. This is new areas you haven't patrolled. Patrol it for a month, and you're going to find something. And this work just happened to be one month before a conference deadline. So that means if snares are found, our students would be able to write a paper. No snares, no paper. And the rangers would patrol, and then they would send us an email every day. Nothing found today, nothing found today, et cetera. Then one day, they sent an email saying they found a poached elephant in this area with its tusks cut off. We were too late to save this elephant, but at least the machine learning model was pointing us in the right direction. Soon thereafter, they said, well, we found a whole elephant snare roll and removed it. So poachers were active in the area. They were killing elephants. But before they could kill the next set of elephants, we were able to remove this elephant snare roll, potentially saving elephants. Then 10 antelope snares were removed. I had promised this students because I was very pessimistic. We would find anything just to motivate everybody. I had offered each student a free drink for every snare found. But at this point, it was like, I, we can't drink anymore. So following this, now it was time to really test if our system worked. So to that end, we worked in three national parks, Queen Elizabeth, Murchison Falls in Uganda, and Sri Park Wildlife Sanctuary in Cambodia. So we don't want to say, wherever you haven't patrolled, you're going to find snares, because that, that's not what we want. We want to be able to show our machine learning model is able to predict, discriminate between areas which we haven't been patrolled, where some are high risk, where more snares will be found, some are low risk, less snares will be found. And that's what we selected 24 areas in each national park. We designated some as high risk. So our model is predicting more snares would be found here, some as low risk, less snares would be found here. And we asked the rangers to go patrol based on our, our model's predictions. And indeed, where we predicted high risk, more snares were found. Where we predicted low risk, less snares were found. So this is what's in the paper. But just as an excitement uh, to us was the fact that when we compared snares captured in 2018 versus 2019. Our system is called Pause Protection Assistant for Wildlife Security. Uh, there's a five-fold increase in the number of snares captured. And these are pictures that were mailed to me on 1st of January 2020. It's a great New Year's present to see oh, all these snares were captured. 2021, 1,000 snares found just in the month of March using Pause. So we are very thrilled that we can be of some assistance to these rangers. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over some of the next steps here in terms of use of game theory to determine patrol routes. So where we are today is PAWS is integrated with SMART. SMART is this consortium of 30 wildlife conservation agencies, WWF, WCS, et cetera. They collect data about all of the poaching incidents. So across the globe, rangers in all sorts of national parks, thousands of national parks, will collect data in SMART about poaching incidents. But this is looking at the past data. PAWS sits on SMART, and they use the SMART database, and then predicts where there may be poaching threats in the future. We've done this integration, there's, and what this means is PAWS is now available to rangers worldwide in 1,000 national parks. So there's a lot of software engineering yet to be done, but we're starting to get reports from different countries where, oh, we tried this, and this is what we found, et cetera. And our team members have been going to different parts of the world. In Belize, uh, Lily Shu, who's been leading this project, Belize and Uganda to keep this project moving forward in terms of assisting these rangers and what can we do to help them in their job. Again, I'm going to skip over this study of deterrence um, and get back to come to the end of this presentation. So I wanted to highlight some of the lessons we have learned. First, achieving social impact and AI innovation go hand in hand. Second, 
partnerships with nonprofits, government agencies, and local communities is crucial in this work in AI for social impact. Third, we don't want to be engaged in uh, helicopter science where you go into a community, take their data, publish a paper, and run away. This is the first question I got in Uganda where the, where the government official pointed, asked me, so you're going to come here, you're going to take our data, you're going to publish a paper critical of government of Uganda, and then leave. And so I had to assure them this is not, maybe the previous research group had done that to you, but we are going to be here and stay here for the long haul and deliver results. Data to deployment pipeline, the whole pipeline is important. It's not just about improving algorithms. It's important to step out of the lab and get out into the field, important particularly for computer scientists in this area. It's important to embrace interdisciplinary work, whether it's social work with conservation scientists and others. And lack of data is the norm. It's a feature in this area. And it must be embraced as part of a project strategy. So as an example, when we first did the work with the social networks for influence maximization, we assumed the networks were available because the homeless shelters had told us we use social networks for influence maximization. Algorithms were developed, and when the student went and said, okay, now give me the social network and I can apply my algorithm, they said, well, there's no social network. And so at that point, we could have ended the project, but the thesis was found in the fact that since there is no social network, we can do sampling intelligently to then run this algorithm. So the papers are really on how can we run influence maximization in the absence of social network using sampling. And so this is an important part uh, of this area. So that's it. I really appreciate your sitting here and listening to me this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, great and shows the impact uh, that AI and more general science can have in a number of different areas. So uh, it's time for questions. Maybe I'll start with one question. So you talked about, you know, in the work that you were doing with India with uh, the maternity type of problems, that the model that was most accurate in terms of prediction was not necessarily the best model to use. Uh, isn't that because you had two subpopulations and sort of one subpopulation that was not the largest was the most important for applying uh, sort of the proper interventions and a model that somehow was able to discriminate between these two subpopulations would have been a better predictive model? So I think, um, uh, with, no, I mean, it's a, it's a great question as to why uh, this, this, you know, why this building a very accurate machine learning model doesn't lead to better performance. If we had enough data and we could build an absolutely accurate model, there wouldn't be a problem. The issue is that there's just not enough data. And so essentially there's some errors in the model. And the question is where do you focus these errors and what Decision-focused learning says, well, this is the decision you, know, you need to take in the end, so you better be accurate about, you know, so in this case, we need to know who are the top K mothers. So we, we just need to be accurate about predicting the top K. Uh, you know, the bottom K, we don't care how, if you're inaccurate about their behaviors. And so by guiding the machine learning, uh, by uh, giving that hint that really the ultimate decision is choosing the top K, it is able to arrive at a better, uh, it is able to make better trade-offs of where to concentrate in terms of its errors. And this leads to better performance. Okay, any questions? Thank you. Uh, mostly missing in, in many instances. Uh, and still you are going through this representation of the feature space. So the two points is how do you basically tackle with that missingness? And the second is how do you plan to expand that feature space, given that you know tomorrow maybe there is more information that you might be able to collect uh, to improve your uh, performance. So in the, uh, I, I, I suppose this is more about the second uh, project where there are no features available and we are really relying on just the you know, past listenership to make predictions of future listenership. I mean, we would love to get some more features so that the predictions are more accurate, but that's just not going to happen. And so, I mean, there basically it's sort of uh, trying out different ideas within the time series prediction approaches. 
so that's been the main theme of that push, trying to figure out can we be as accurate as possible, just looking at the listenership data. But we are happy to uh, you know, look at other ideas. So for example, we may have information about the health block or the sub-district that the mother belongs to. So if we have that, can we use that uh, in some fashion to improve our predictions? Um, so those are the types of ideas that we are trying to figure out. But it's a really uh, a sparse domain and, and you know sparse data domain, and, and it's really a very interesting and challenging domain. Therefore, Rebecca has a question. Great, thanks for such a uh, wonderful talk that even those of us uninitiated in these methods could understand. So thank you, oh, for, thank you. for the clarity of that. Uh, so back to Yanis's question uh, about the two-stage model performing really well. So you're, the, the outcome you were optimizing in the second stage was the conversion of a mom from you know, the, the good state or the bad state to the good state. But in fact, the, the, is there a third stage there where what you're actually trying to do is uh, preferentially target, or is there an opportunity to preferentially target the moms that are more likely to translate listening to the messages into actual behavior change towards the baby? Like, is there a, a room for a third stage in that model optimization? That's, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. We have an ongoing health study right now to try and figure out where we actually benefit. So it's right now the focus of Arman has been just get them to listen more, but ultimately, they should translate into improved behaviors, like, oh, they actually started eating more green leafy vegetables, or uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's a very complicated problem, because uh, given the, you know, the financial status of this family, Arman may say you should eat this and you should eat that, but they don't have any money to go out and get those things. And so it becomes a very uh, uh, complicated relationship. But it's exactly the right thing, what you've said, that we should investigate and try and understand where there is actually an improvement in health behavior. And then there becomes this question of, um, you know, there are people who will just get the information. And they will not be able to translate it into actual behavior change, at least in some instances. But should they, now what should we do with that? Should we now start saying, well, maybe we should, you know, not target them. It, it's a very interesting uh, question related to equity and fairness and so forth. So, I, I mean, I agree. It's a very interesting area to look into. In the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also appreciated the presentation. I got a lot more out of it than I thought I would, and I and I appreciate that. So, um, did the mic die? I yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, every time I go to talk, it. OK, it's fine. Uh, so the question I had, I'm just going to talk. Uh, and hopefully it comes on. <laughs> the question I had was, um, I had two questions, one about the first study and one about the second one. So we'll see what I can get to. But the first question was, um, you know, I'm always thinking about where you intervene in a system, right? And having now having had two children of my own and seeing how much pressure is put on moms, um, you know, part of my question is, have you explored intervening in the social network around the mom as opposed to directly with the mom? So, you know, obviously people's access to a social network may be different depending on who they are. I don't know what the cultural status is of folks who are living in lower income India, but, um, you know, presumably, if you give the message to the mom to eat more green leafy vegetables, she'll get that message and then she'll like, well, when I'm done breastfeeding and changing a million diapers or doing whatever else I have to to take care of the baby, I'll think about buying greens. Or if you send that to the, the grandmother if, or the grandfather, if they're in the picture, maybe it'll be more likely to actually start having the health outcome. So I'm wondering if you all have been exploring sort of the social network model for intervening in the child health. Because not, you know, it takes a village is the, is yeah, yeah. the uh, maxim there. We've asked uh, our partner about this, you know, social network, and can we influence some, uh, you know, someone who has successfully done the program and use them as a role model for others and so on. But somehow they have insisted that these are, you know, at any one time the cohort that comes in, you know, mothers who are expecting are all from different areas, and it's very hard to imagine that there is a social network there. But the other part of it, which is the fam getting the family involved. Um, that's very interesting. They've done a lot of work. It's not our work. Uh, the, the nonprofit themselves have done a lot of work. Often these are shared phones because this is not 
you know, they can't afford more than one phone. Mm -hmm. And so then that means that the message gets listened to by the husband and the wife together or uh, by the whole family together. And so they, they, have a, they have tried to ensure that somehow they understand it's not maybe just the mother who's listening, but also others in the family. And so they'll try, they've tried to kind of cater their messages somewhat to that. Um, cool. But yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting direction to see what else uh, can be done. Right, sort of related to the second study as well as like having not very much information about the social network, but then trying to find these sort of that's peer right. influencers. Um, and then the second question I had is uh, with the poaching model, are the, the patrols actually being informed about where they should be patrolling and does that information change with some frequency? That's a, that's a, a great question. So the idea there was that, uh, you know, if we tell the, the rangers, you know, here's where there's a lot of poaching, you just go there, then the poachers will figure out, okay, they're here all the time, we'll go right. somewhere else. And so that's the kind of the game theory approach that uh, uh, we have been trying, I mean, we have explored uh, and trying to insert into the patrolling so that the patrols are randomized so that they don't always go to the same location. And it is important, <clears throat> in Cambodia, we were told that uh, because the number of traps captured had increased, now the poachers actually attack the rangers uh, uh, and, and, you know, and so, so, so it is important to, to, you know, randomize and make sure that the poachers can't predict where the rangers will be also. And so, yeah, yeah that's, a, that's also a very interesting direction for us to continue pushing. Great. Thank you for showing us some ways that we can use AI to, to actually help, uh, you know, people in the real world. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that. So if I can ask one last uh, question. How do you evaluate programs where it's voluntary to register or not. So you mentioned some results on, uh, you know, the women that registered yeah. in the program and increased baby weight. Is that also could be attributed to some sort of self-selection bias? So because those who register maybe are more open to following recommendations and... So the... the Previous randomized control trial was uh, work done by the, by Arman, by Dr. Hegde herself, and so there they you know they controlled properly for everything. So it's uh, and it's on their website the whole situation of the study. So there the you know it's like identical groups. One got all the messages and one got zero messages, and then they checked at the end what happened. So there the uh, so they've taken care, I suppose. I mean I, I would say that uh, there is no selection bias in this fashion. Um, and in our work, uh, we are only, you know, working with different groups of people who have registered within Arman, and we're just changing within the normal workflow of the uh, Arman system. We are only changing who gets a service call. So rather than doing random, can we use infuse AI in it to to try to improve that? So in that way, we've tried to keep things as equal as possible when uh, running our experiments. Okay. So I think let's thank uh, the speaker. We'll stop here and uh, thank you. Thank you for your uh, kind remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you.